It's you. It's real. There. No, no, please, don't be frightened. My name is Nicodemus. Please, I must go. No, no, please, Mary. I, I am desperate for your help, Mary. I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. I'm visiting from Jerusalem. I'm a man of God. And I believe you have experienced a miracle, Mary. So how do you know who I am? You really don't remember me at all. I burned incense. I don't remember. It's all a blur. And I can't go back into that. No, no, I don't want you to. I can't even imagine. But you you are healed. That that much is clear. I, I just want to understand how it happened. It makes two of us. <laughs> how long after my visit did you feel the change? It wasn't anything you did. It was someone else. Some one else? He called me Mary. He said, I am his. I am redeemed. And it was so? Who did this? I don't know his name. What does he look like? Is he a member of Sanhedrin? Would you at least know him if you saw him again? <laughs> I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I... I don't understand it myself. But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. I have to be home to prepare for Shabbat, as I'm sure you do. Shabbat Shalom, Nicodemus. Shabbat Shalom. Well, good morning. Happy Easter to everyone. Can we just put our hands together and welcome our guest? <laughs> welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you are with us here this morning. Would you make this declaration that is written on the screen with me? Let's say this together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen in me. What does that mean? He is risen in me. If someone asks you why Easter is such a big deal for Christians, what would you say? I believe the greatest claim of Christianity is Jesus changed my life. I used to be one way, now I am completely different, and the thing that happened in between was him. The greatest evidence of the resurrection and the greatest testimony that we have as believers is Jesus changed my life. That was Mary Magdalene's story in the Bible, the woman we just watched on the video. You can Google her. She went from being demon-possessed to becoming a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. She put all the guys to shame. She was the most devoted disciple. Jesus changed Mary's life. Same is true for Saul of Tarsus. He was a very learned man. He did his best to destroy Christianity. He wanted to wipe it off the face of the earth. But then one day, Saul encountered Jesus. And his life changed so much that he went from being Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul, who wrote over half 
of the New Testament. Wow. Jesus radically changed Paul's life. So if you would ask me, so Harv, why is Easter such a big deal? Here's why. When you and I really encounter the resurrected Christ, our life is forever changed. Resurrection equals a changed life. When we believe in Jesus and we place the full weight of our faith in his death and in his resurrection, our lives are forever changed. Every time we baptize someone here at Cross Point, when we put them under the water, we say buried with Christ in baptism. So we identify with Christ's death in baptism. And when we pull them up out of the water, we say raised to walk in newness of life. In baptism, we identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a celebration that we belong to Jesus and we realize that he has forever changed our life. Look at this verse. This was written by Paul. He says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. Look at this. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. This verse explains why Easter is such a big deal. For those of us who have said yes to Jesus, the power of his resurrection has changed our life and it continues to change our life. He resurrected us from spiritual death to spiritual life, and he continues to resurrect us from death to life. So the truest testimony of every believer is, I used to be one way, now I am completely different, and what happened in between was him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, my friends, is the power behind our testimony of a changed life. That's what makes Easter such a big deal. Now, you might be thinking, you know, Harv, that sounds really good. How does this happen? Well, here's how. Grace can rewrite the story of your life. Grace can rewrite the story of our life. If you would say, honestly, Harv, my, my life is just a mess, then my friend, you are in the right place. <laughs> you really are. Because grace can rewrite the story of your life on this Easter Sunday morning. When Mary Magdalene encountered Jesus, her life was a total wreck. But Jesus offered her grace, and grace rewrote the story of her life. Same thing with the Apostle Paul. There's a guy named C.S. Lewis. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, several other books, he was a brilliant man. When he was in his 20s, he was an atheist. But then, at the age of 30, he became a theist. He started believing in one supreme being. And then, at the age of 32, he became a Christian. And when someone asked him, what makes Christianity so unique? What makes it different than any other religion? Lewis said, oh, that's easy grace. The concept of grace is what makes Christianity different than any other world religion. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Grace is God giving to us what we don't deserve. Grace is God giving us his love, his forgiveness, his righteousness, his life, his mercy, and his power just because he's gracious. That seems too good to be true, doesn't it? But my friends, this is how and why God's grace can rewrite the story of our life. It's all about something that he does for us that we don't deserve at all. You see, grace, let's be honest about this, grace goes against every instinct that we have as human beings. You know, we want people to be punished for their sins, but grace, God's grace defies reason and logic. 
And when we come to Christ as a sinner and we encounter his grace, we are forgiven, and get this, we are forgiven and his love interrupts the consequences of our actions. You see, through grace, let me say that again because that's like, wow. Through God's grace, God's love interrupts the consequences of our actions. Here's what I mean by that. You and I should have to pay for our sins, right? Because we're sinners. Look at this verse. What's that first word? All. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Now, I understand some of you here are, are pretty good people. Uh, some of you might say, yeah, I'm, I'm a sinner, but I'm kind of a boring sinner, right? But some of us here this morning are spectacular sinners, <laughs> right? And even though I'm a pastor, I will tell you, I can be a spectacular sinner. I can sin with the worst of them. Thank God for his grace, amen? If you'd say, how can you say that? Let me tell you, the Apostle Paul would say the same thing. Thank God for his grace. We've all sinned, but here's where grace comes in. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, my friends, the reason why we are completely changed when we say yes to Jesus is because we realize that we are completely forgiven. You see, on the cross, Jesus purchased our forgiveness and by his resurrection, he sealed the deal forever. And do you know where Jesus is right now? He is standing at the right hand of God the Father, making sure that we stand forgiven before God forever. Wow, that's amazing. My friends, because of Jesus' resurrection, you and I can live a forgiven life. And because we know that we are forever forgiven our lives are forever changed. David Jeremiah puts it like this, because he is risen, our failures are not final. Anybody else have a big bag of failures in their life? Ooh, oh my. If you do, you are in the right place this morning. My friends, because he is risen, the failures of your life and my life, they do not define us and they are not final. Why? Because Jesus has risen from the grave. And in doing so, he proves that he can turn our failures into victories. That is an ultimate picture of grace. Grace that exceeds all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of our past. I mean, that should cause the most traditional person here to say, well, hallelujah, right? Now, think about this. The reason why Mary Magdalene was such a devout follower of Jesus is because she realized that Jesus had completely forgiven her. And all of her sins, past, present, and future, they were all gone and they were forgotten by Jesus. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes our sins from us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ offers us a forgiven life. But my friends, it does more than that. When we know we are forgiven, it gives us a reason for living. Say that with me. When we know we are forgiven, it gives us a reason for living. When we know we are forgiven, it gives us purpose and meaning for living. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us a meaningful life. Yes, we are saved and forgiven for eternity, but I want you to know this. God has a purpose for your life right here, right now, today. This is exactly what the resurrection did for Peter. After he denied Jesus, he was a wreck. He thought he was just going to go back and, and be a fisherman. Jesus had other plans for him. Jesus forgave him and reinstated him, and Peter became completely different. He became the rock the New Testament church was built on, and he went on to live a very meaningful life. Same thing with the Apostle Paul. Once the Apostle Paul knew that he was forgiven, he found his reason for living, and he went on to write half of the New Testament. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers you and I a forgiven life and a meaningful life. My friends, on this Easter Sunday morning, if you are struggling, if you are discouraged or you're depressed, if you're trying to just pick up the broken pieces of your life, the resurrected Christ would say to you, believe in me, say yes to me, let grace rewrite the story of your life. Let my resurrection power sweep into your life and forgive you and let my resurrection power give you reason and purpose for living. Church, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives inside of us, which means the same things that were going on inside of Jesus should be going inside of us. We should be completely different than the people of this world. We're not simply forgiven. The resurrection, it motivates us to live differently. It causes us to push back against the suffering and the evil in this world. It causes us to push back against the growing apathy and the evil ideologies. It causes us to offer words of hope and, and love. It causes our deeds to reflect mercy and justice like Jesus did when he was here on earth. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us. And because a resurrected life is a changed life. My friends, the greatest evidence of the resurrection and the greatest testimony that we have as believers is Jesus changed my life. I want to invite Keith Sidwell to come. He's a dear friend and a wonderful man of God. And I want him to share his testimony of how Jesus Christ changed his life. Keith. Thank you, Pastor Harv. Um, I know what you're thinking. I'm not going to cry. So pray for me because I just might, okay? I tell you, listening to uh, your sermon so far reminds me of all the things that are important to share about uh, transformation, the transformation through Christ. And Mary summed it up very well. I was this before he came along, and now I'm different. But um, let me just share, you my, share my story. So I am a sinner, and by the grace and love of Jesus, I accepted Jesus as my Savior at 10. Uh, at Sunday school in Vineland, New Jersey, Mrs. Perez was a great lady. She, uh, she was long-suffering with a bunch of us kids in her class. <laughs> She pulled me out one day and said, hey, do you want to know Jesus? And would you accept him into your heart? And I said, yeah. And uh, I, it's, I'll come back to that later. However, the next two decades, I lived for me, myself, and I. It was all about Keith. Until the age of 27, living in Los Angeles, I rededicated my life to Jesus. And today, here I am doing my best on a daily basis to keep my eyes on Jesus and to live out my faith in, through the example and teaching of Jesus through his word. That is the quick and the short of the testimony. Now, we all know there's probably a whole lot more that I could be sharing of that story. In fact, we all have chapters of our lives, some good, some not so good, and some pretty terrible. With that said, I've learned over the years, as I've shared my testimony, to not honor or dignify or adulate my sinful life. Rather, I feel compelled and have a desire to praise and esteem the transformative power of Jesus. His resurrected, transformed life in me um, allows me to never have to go back to that ugly cesspool dung pile of my life where he found me. Um, instead, today, I live in the freedom of Christ, forgiven, 
renewed, redeemed, restored, and in the process of growing closer to him through my faith. This is the same Jesus that Pastor Harv was talking about. And today could be the day that you can accept him into your heart, and I pray that you do. So, if the Lord gave you an assignment in 1991 to go find Keith Sidwell before it's too late, this is where you would have found me. I was living in my car in Marina Del Rey, Venice, California, which is a coastal town in Los Angeles. I just moved there from Toledo, Ohio, and I uh, moved from, I'm sorry, Toledo with my girlfriend at the time. Um, we were completely a mess. <laughs> Didn't know it, um, but we were. So I said to her, uh, after she says to me one day, she goes, hey, if we're going to get married, we, we have to be Christians. Or you have to be a Christian, is what she said. Assuming she was. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. Um, I've, I've been faking it for a long, long time. So what's going to church going to hurt? So we go to this church. And uh, within the third, after the third visit, I turned to her and I said, you know, we are living completely opposite of what this guy is preaching. If we're going to really do this, we have to be serious and change our ways. Within three days of making that commitment, our relationship erupted, and I was then living in my car because one of us was going to die. It was that toxic. Uh, we were two highly dysfunctional people, and the level of toxicity was just so profound, it was imperative that we separate our ways. With the help of several uh, godly mentors at the Vineyard Church that I was attending, um, I rededicated my life. And I was able to set a course for Jesus, and I've not turned back since then. Um, side note, um, the young lady that I moved to L.A. with, she, through the grapevine of friends back in Toledo, Ohio, is doing well. I mention that because there were moments where I thought it was not, it was going to end for her or for me. And oddly enough, if it wasn't for her to invite me to L.A., <laughs> invite me to L.A., I wouldn't have turned. <laughs> but since 1991, <coughs> Jesus has done the following in me. He's forgiven me, and he continues to forgive me. He fulfilled his promise to indwell in my heart, in my very being, his Holy Spirit. And he freely gives that to anyone who asks. He healed my heart from the many wounds of my life, a good portion of which were self-inflicted. He has continued to redeem and restore what I thought were two lost decades selfishness and indulgence. He allowed me to serve, he has allowed me to serve in missions, Bible study, fellowship, and also to continue to seek as many ways as he can use me to fulfill his commission that he's given to all of us. He provides a way, a path for me to be alive To learn, to grow, so that I may have an opportunity to find, to develop, and maintain healthy relationships with the most important people, Jesus, as I mentioned, my beautiful wife, my daughters,
my extended family and all of you. In summary, my Redeemer, Jesus, he lives, he lives in my heart. And I am forever loved by him. Please consider today the same decision I made 32 years ago to follow Jesus. It's the best decision I've ever made. And if you think it gets boring, try again. It gets way better. So thank you, Harv. God bless you all. Thank you, Keith. Let's stand up, brother.
The greatest evidence of the resurrection and the greatest testimony that we have as believers is Jesus changed my life. I used to be one way and now I am completely different and the thing that happened in between was him. Thank you, Keith, for your testimony of a changed life. We're just saying the resurrected king is resurrecting me. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. He is breathing life back into my lifeless body. My friends, that's the message of Easter. You see, when we say yes to Jesus, something spiritual happens in our life. We are spiritually born again. We become alive in Christ in sharp contrast, without Jesus, spiritually speaking, we are just dead people walking around. And when we look at our world today, this is so evident. When we look at suicide in our world and the hopelessness in our world, when we look at hate, and the desperation in our world today, we realize that something has gone very wrong. And my friends, the more we have pushed Jesus out of our society, the more hopeless our society has become. My friends, I submit to you that without Jesus, we are just dead people walking around. 
without the power of the resurrected Christ living in us, we live in a world without forgiveness, without meaning, without hope, without purpose, and without grace. Here's how Paul describes this to us. He writes, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. I think that sounds like a pretty good explanation for what is wrong in our world today. But Paul doesn't throw the world under the bus. Look at what he says. He says, all of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were, what's the word? dead because of our sins he gave us life when he raised christ from the dead it is only by god's grace that you have been saved and here's the message of easter look at this for god raised us from the dead right along with christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus Christ. We are united in his death and resurrection. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. We are united in Christ Jesus through belief in his death and his resurrection. Paul continues, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew, death to life in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. My friends, when we receive the gift of salvation, when we embrace Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, and when we embrace his resurrection from the grave as our own, our lives are forever changed. As believers, our spiritual reality is that when God raised Christ from the dead, he raised us from the dead at the same time. In other words, now picture this, when Jesus was in the grave, spiritually speaking, we were right there in the grave with him. And we were dead in our sins, and there was nothing you and I could do about it. But when Jesus was resurrected, before he stepped out of the tomb, he turned around and he called us by name, and he spoke to our dead corpses. By the way, Jesus is the only person who can speak to something that is dead and get a response, right? And he said to us, does anybody want to walk out of the grave? Does anybody want to receive my grace? Does anybody want to receive a forgiven life and a meaningful life and a powerful life and a resurrected life? Does anybody want to walk out of the darkness of this tomb and walk into the light of day where you can experience newness of life? That's the invitation. Jesus says, if so, you can be co-resurrected with me. Does anybody want to change life? That's the invitation of Easter. My friends, when God's grace meets our willingness to say yes to him, we experience a changed life. You see, before we come to Jesus, we are dead in our sins. But when God's grace meets our free will and by faith we say yes to him, at that moment we step out of the grave and we step into a resurrected life. That's the message of Easter. My friends, the resurrected Jesus offers you today a forgiven life. He offers you a meaningful life. He offers you a powerful life. You do not have to live in defeat we can live in victory because the resurrected king can resurrect us to victorious life in him. 
We can live in the power of his resurrection. And this resurrected life, guess what? It's a life that never ends. You guys know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. My friends, that's the message of Easter. So let me ask you today, are you experiencing this kind of life? If you're not, I want to give you the opportunity right now to invite Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, into your life this morning. Would you bow your heads? And would you close your eyes? My friends, inviting Christ into our life is as simple as admitting that we are a sinner, believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he rose again on Easter, receiving him as our personal Savior and inviting him into our life. If you would like to do that this morning, I encourage you to repeat this prayer right where you sit after me. Pray with me by faith. Dear God, I've sinned and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again on Easter. Right now, I receive the gift of salvation. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. I invite you to come into my life. Change my life. May your resurrection power change me today. I embrace a forgiven life. I embrace a meaningful life. I embrace a powerful life and I embrace a forever life because of what you have done for me on the cross and through your resurrection. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed? If you prayed that prayer this morning, would you just raise your hands? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All over the sanctuary. Thank you, you can put your hands down. For everyone who prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to get into a church that preaches the word of God. Tell someone that you know who's a Christian that you gave your heart to Jesus today. I would love to talk with you. I would love to to challenge you in your faith. This church would warmly welcome you. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, you see all these that raised their hand today. Your spirit is here. You've been here the whole service. Lord, I I know you use Keith's testimony to speak to hearts, and you're using your word to draw people, and I thank you. I pray for these who said yes to you today. I pray that they would know that they are stepping out of the grave into your light and into your life. May they know you, Jesus. May they experience a forgiven life and a meaningful life and a powerful life and a life that goes on and on forever. I bless these who have made the decision to say yes to you today. May they grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are. May this be the best Easter that they've ever had. May they always be able to point back to Easter 2023 and say, I gave my heart and life to Jesus on Easter 2023. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hey, can we stand together, put our hands together?